Real princesses do not grow on trees. You just have to wait for one to come to you. And if one does, just to be sure, make her a bed of twelve feather mattresses. And underneath those twelve feather mattresses, place a small pea green garden pea. Then wait for the moon to set and the sun to rise. And if she wakes up all black and blue, you know that you have indeed discovered a real princess. The princess and the pea in miniature. Once upon a time, many moons ago, of course, there was a king and a queen who had a prince for a son. He was a nice boy and not unpleasant to look at. In fact, handsome. Not too handsome, just handsome enough. One day, when the prince was old enough, his parents decided it was time for him to be married. You know what parents are like, and a prince's parents are no different. The prince didn't object to the idea, but he did make one condition. He wanted to marry for love. He was just that kind of romantic boy. He told his father and his mother, I would gladly marry tomorrow, but whoever she is, she must be more mesmerizing than the moon, and I must find her more fascinating than all the stars in the sky, and there must be a certain something about her. What something? Asked the queen. Just something, replied the prince. Yes, yes, agreed the king. That's all very lovely, but our condition is that she must be a princess of blue blood, an equal in royalness to you. The prince wasn't all that interested in these details, but knew he wouldn't get any peace until he agreed. So he did. Now, you may think finding yourself a suitable princess would be easy to do if you are a handsome prince. But you would be wrong. Just how many mesmerizing and fascinating princesses do you imagine there are out there? Well, the king and queen did all the traditional fairy tale things in order that their son might be bowed over by the right girl. They threw a royal ball and invited all the single royal girls in the land. Everyone said yes. Everyone danced. Everyone had a good time. But none of them captured the prince's heart. The prince explained to the king and the queen how simply none of them was mesmerizing or fascinating, and none of them, not one of them, had a certain something about them. No, if he could marry for love, then he would rather live alone for all eternity, gazing at all the stars in the night sky. Not only was he romantic, but also a little dramatic. The king and queen said, The thing is, our dear son, what you're really looking for is a real princess, and a real princess is a rare thing indeed. They do not grow on trees, said the king. No, no, they do not said the queen. You see, said the king, a real princess is not only mesmerizingly beautiful and fascinatingly interesting, but most important of all, she has manners, said the queen. No one should ever travel without them, said the king. No, never, never go anywhere without your manners, agreed the queen, taking her elbows off the table. 
the only problem with real princesses, sighed the king, is that they are terribly hard to get hold of, and they almost never read their post. No, indeed, said the queen. Real princesses are very hard to come by. No one has ever found one by looking. You just have to wait for one to come to you. But the prince, who rarely listened to his mother's advice, did the traditional fairy tale find yourself a bright thing of riding far and wide, looking throughout the kingdom for a real princess. He even rode far and wide to other people's kingdoms. But in Far Land, all the girls he met were fascinatingly beautiful, but horribly vain. And in the kingdom of Shonen, they were all mesmerizingly clever, but exceedingly dull. And in Harvonia, there was a certain silliness about them. I mean, you can see his problem, can't you? The prince came back very downcast. He refused to eat anything for supper. Not even the very delicious rook pie the royal cook had prepared as a welcome home. He lighted a candle in his window and just stood and gazed into the night sky. Not so far away in a treetop house, just over the mountain, there was a girl with the most beautiful black black hair you have ever seen, or possibly never seen. She woke up that night to see the moon dancing on her ceiling, and she popped on her favorite pea green dress and glided down the stairs into the garden. The moonlight shone in such a magical way that she wondered to herself if it could possibly look as beautiful on the other side of the garden wall. So she tripped down the garden path, stepped over a pile of unopened letters and slipped through the gate, where she saw the moon perched on the top of the mountain. I wonder if the moon would be as beautiful up there, she thought out loud. And it was, so she continued walking, right down the other side of the mountain, until she came to the wild woods. Would it be so beautiful in the woods? Considered the girl. And it was, it really was. But just as she came out of the woods, a dark cloud moved across the moon. And suddenly, it wasn't. Bother, thought the girl. She could feel a heavy storm brewing. She would never make it back to her own little tree house in time. There was nothing for it but to walk on. So on she walked. She had not gone more than seven steps when she felt the first heavy drop of rain fall on her cheek. Bother, thought the girl. Within three minutes, she was already soaked to skin, and her two shoes were filled with water. The wind was howling. The trees were creaking and cracking as if they might part company with their roots, and the rain pounded down and the lightning flashed its forked town in the darkened sky, and the girl began to tire. It was not umbrella weather. No, an umbrella would have done you no good at all. Hmm, I think I might just catch a terrible cold, unless I have the very good fortune to spot a light in the window. But what is the likelihood of that? on a wild, wild night in the middle of nowhere, said the girl out loud, 
However, as she made her way round the next corner, that's exactly what she saw. Using her very last drop of energy, she climbed the steep, steep steps to a huge front door. The queen was woken all of a sudden by a very, very loud knock at the palace door. Being a queen, she sensibly woke her husband, an unusual heavy sleeper, and asked him to go and see who in all the kingdom might be banging on the door at this time of night. For goodness' sake! When the king opened the door, what he saw was a dripping wet girl standing, without even a coat, on his doorstep. She had long, ribbon black hair, and skin as pale as ivory, and lips as red as rose petals. You know how it is with these fairy tale types. She was, despite the effects of the weather, a real beauty. But she was also shivering cold, and looked as if she might collapse at any moment. Of course, the king was very polite. He had manners. That's the thing about real kings; their manners are impeccable. He didn't even mention the large puddle that was formed on his very expensive royal floor. Instead, he told the girl to warm herself by the fire while he called for his wife, who didn't particularly want to get up. On such an unreasonable night, but being a real queen, never ever forgot to be hospitable to strangers. The queen thought this girl looked special. There was something mesmerizing, something fascinating, something, something that the queen could not quite put her finger on. I like her husband. She came straight to the point. So, my dear, who are you on such a wild, an unruly night? Oh, I am a princess, and I live in a tree house on the other side of the mountain. A tree house? Pondered the king. A princess? Inquired. The queen, what kind of princess? Oh, I replied the girl. I am a real princess. I was outside admiring the moon when it started to rain, and then, what with the thunder and lightning, well, then I lost my way, and then I saw a light in your window. I do hope you can forgive my waking you at such an hour. The queen thought, "Well, she sounds like a real princess. She looks like a real princess, but we'll see." So after the girl had finished her outer flower quadrille, the queen ordered a steam hot bath, and supplied her. With the softest of towels, and an exquisite nightgown. Oh, this is far too good for me," said the girl. Which, of course, is exactly the kind of thing a real princess would say. While the girl was taking her bath, the queen had the servants make up the bed, in a most unusual fashion. She chose the most fabulous bedchamber with the most beautiful four-poster bed. Then, right in the middle of the bed, she placed a tiny, tiny pea green pea from the royal garden. Then, on the top of the pea, she piled one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve feather mattresses. And on top of the twelve mattresses, she placed the finest linen sheets, and the plumpest Arabian goose-down pillows. What a beautiful bed! Gasped 
the girl. Oh, I am sure I will sleep like a real princess in this bed. And up the ladder she climbed. We'll see, thought the queen. But that night, the poor girl hardly slept a wink. She was tossing and turning all night. Despite her exhaustion, she could not make herself comfortable. Worse still, the next morning she found herself black and blue, and rather achy. At daybreak, the queen knocked on the door with a cup of tea. How did you sleep, my dear? I trust comfortably. Not wanting to be rude, the girl replied, "Oh, very well. Yes, perfectly. Thank you so much for asking." Aha! Thought the queen. I knew she couldn't really be a real, real princess. But what the queen was forgetting was that any real princess has such impeccable manners that it would be impossible for her to tell her host, who had gone to all the effort of making her a bed stacked with twelve feather mattresses, that in fact. It was the most uncomfortable night that she had ever had in all her life. The queen, though most disappointed, invited her young guest to have breakfast down in the royal dining room. When the prince saw the girl, his eyes light up. He thought she was more mesmerizing than the moon, and when she spoke, he found her. More fascinating than the stars, and there was a certain something about her that caused him to let go of his teacup, which clattered to the floor. The princess couldn't help thinking there was something romantic, something dramatic, something strangely charming about his clumsiness, and she bent down to pick up the cup. A real princess will always pick up your teacup if you drop it. Kindness is particularly their middle name. But this was not the only reason she did so. There was a light in the prince's dark eyes, which reminded her of all the stars in the night sky. It did not escape the queen's notice that as the girl bent down, she let out a cry. Something a bit like, "Ouch!" Whatever is the matter, my dear? Asked the king. Oh dear, I am all aches and pains today, and I just don't know why. And I feel so awful when you went to so much effort, and how ungrateful I must seem. And I hope you will forgive me. But there was nothing to forgive because. As anyone will know, a girl who can turn black and blue when a tiny, tiny pea green garden pea is placed under twelve feather mattresses must just surely be a real princess. The prince, who was not very bothered about this detail, simply said, "There is a certain something about you." And the girl smiled and told him her name. And after the moon had risen and set several more times, the prince asked the girl to marry him. That's the thing about real princes; they know all the right questions to ask. And she, being a bright girl, as all real princesses are, knew a real prince when she saw one, and said yes. And they were married in a very real fashion outside in a garden, where the sky twinkled with stars, and the moon shone down, and everyone had a splendid time. Peas were not served because, as everyone knows, real princesses are not especially fond of peas. Today's story is from the northern Spain. Is written by Andrew Long 
in 1906. Close your eyes, relax, and listen to the story. The girl who became a fish. Once there was a girl who lived by the river, and all she ever wanted to do was to dance around the house or go out with her friends. Her mother and father worked hard all day, but she never offered to help them, not once. One day, though, something strange came over her. Sit down, mother," she said. "You're looking very tired. Is there anything I can do to help?" Her mother slumped into a chair. Amazed to hear such kind words from her lazy daughter. Well, yes, there is something, dear. Could you take your father's fishing net out and mend any holes you can see? So the girl did as she was asked. She bundled up the net in her arms, took it out to the river bank, found a comfortable place to sit, and spent the morning. Mending holes until there was not a single one to be found. She enjoyed herself too, for everyone who went past, up and down the river, on either side, stopped for a chat, and to tell her how good it was to see her helping with the cores. The girl was just folding the net to carry it back in, when she heard a splash. Looking around, she saw a mighty fish jumping clear off the water. Quick as a flash, she spread the net wide and threw it out over the river. Hauling it back in, she was delighted to see the fish thrashing about inside. "Got you!" she cried happily, for it was her first ever catch. Then she looked more closely at the brightly colored fish. "Aren't you a beauty? Father will be proud of me." But the fish stared back up at her, with its sea green eyes, and replied, "You'd better not eat me, girl. For if you do, I'll turn you into a fish yourself." Huh? Cried the girl, for she did not believe a word of it. Running straight to her mother, she led the old woman over to the river bank. Come and see what I've caught. It's a talking fish, and it just told me that if I ate it, it'll turn me into a fish too. And she nearly doubled over with laughter, but. It was no laughing matter to her wise old mother. Put the thing back, girl," she pleaded, "for it must have magical powers. Put it back in the water before something terrible happens." Don't be silly, mother. We can't afford to waste such a wonderful catch. And I'm so hungry after working hard all morning. Go cook it, mother dear. And I'll be in to eat it in a few minutes. So the old mother, with a heavy heart, took the fish inside, and the young girl ran off to gather flowers for her hair. When she came back in, there was the fish, served up on a platter in the middle of the table. It looks absolutely delicious. Cried the hungry girl, plunging her fork into the dish, and helping herself to a large piece. But as soon as it touched her mouth, a cold shiver ran through her. Her head seemed to flatten, her eyes began to dart all around, her arms and legs stuck to her sides, and she found herself. Gasping widely for breath, then spying the open window, she sprang through it with one great leap, 
and landed with a splash in the cold, clear river. Her horrified parents ran after her, but all they could see was a shoal of fish circling around in the water, and had no way of knowing which was their daughter. Her father rushed to fetch his net, but by the time he came back, they had swam off down toward the sea. What sort of fish are you? Asked the others, crowding around the shocked little fish girl. Where have you come from? I'm not a fish at all. The newcomer spluttered, swallowing a load of water as she spoke. I'm a girl, or at least I was until. And she turned away, for she did not want them to see her crying. Until you caught a fish, I'd imagine," said a wise old haddock. And you didn't believe it had the power to carry out its threat, did you? Well, never mind. The same thing happened to some of us here, and it's not such a bad life. Come along to meet our queen, for she lives in a beautiful palace. So off they went, a great shawl of them, and the new little fish girl. Was amazed at everything there was to see. Jellyfish and multicolored seaweeds floating just below the surface, and further out and deeper. Great sunken anchors, broken ships, and treasures—so many treasures, pearls, and jewels. And gold lay scattered about on the seabed. And the bones of dead sailors poked up out of the sand. Here we are at last! Cried the haddock, leading her into the palace. The poor little fish girl was exhausted from having swum so far and so fast, but she was struck by the beauty all around her, for the walls. Were made of pale pink coral, worn smooth by the waters, and around the windows were rows of pearls. The doors were standing open, and the whole troop floated into the great hall, where the queen, half woman, half fish, was seated on a throne of blue and green shell. Who have we here? She asked, and the little fish girl told her story. Now, sit down here beside me," said the queen, when she had finished. And I shall tell you my own story, for I also was once a girl. I married a prince. And became queen of faraway country. But a year later, when I was out in the garden with my baby son, a giant appeared and stole my crown. He told me he would give it to his daughter, and enchant my husband so that he would think she was his wife, not me. I was so upset when I heard this that I threw myself into the sea, and my ladies in waiting, who loved me, followed me in. And here I must remain until someone brings me back my crown. I will fetch it for you," cried the little fish girl. For she was desperate to get back on dry land, whatever the cost. Do you think you could? The queen studied her face. First, you must find the giant's castle, on the top of a high mountain, 
for I've heard that his daughter has since dead, and the giant has the crown once more. I'll try," said the brave little fish girl. "Good luck then, but you must be careful, for if the foe and horrible giant sees you, he will surely kill you. All I can give you to help you in your quest is the power to change into any animals you wish. Just strike your forehead." And call out its name. The next morning, the fish girl swam to shore, and when she got there, she struck her forehead with her tail. I want to be a deer, she cried, and that moment she became a beautiful proud beast, with branching horns and slender legs. Throwing back her head and sniffing the air, she broke into a run, leaping easily over the rivers, walls, and hedges that stood in her way. Now the king's son was out hunting, and he spotted the deer. He raced after her, on his swift-footed horse, and soon. Caught up, please do not kill me," the deer cried, pleading with her eyes, "for I have far to run and much to do." The prince was amazed to hear a deer speak, and captivated by the beauty in her eyes, this must surely be an enchanted maiden. He muttered to himself. As she raced free, I will marry her and no other. But the deer had gone, and try as he might, he could not find her. When she arrived at the giant's castle, the walls were too high to jump. I will be an ant, she cried, and there. And then she became a tiny insect, scuttling up the wall. Soon she was over the top and down in the courtyard, where she spied a tall tree, reaching up a high window. And now I'll be a monkey, she whispered, and in a second, a loose-limbed little monkey. Was swinging up through the branches, and into the room where the giant lay snoring. Then, a parrot, she cried, and flying onto the giant's shoulder, she squacked in his ear. The crown is no longer yours, big fellow. Now that your daughter is dead. What? Growled the giant, reaching out to grab the insolent bird. Spare me! The parrot squawked. Please spare me! Why should I? The giant tightened his grip. Why should I take pity on a puny little parrot, who sneaks into my room, wakes me up by screeching into my ear? And tells me, I have to give up my crown. But then a thought slowly began to sip into his tiny brain, and he put down the frightened bird in order to scratch his head. Not unless you can bring me the thing I've always wanted—a collar of blue stones. From the Arch of Saint Martin, in the great city, I'll do it straight away," said the parrot, hopping over to the window. She had no idea how she would manage it, but she was not going to tell the ugly great giant that. "I want to be an eagle," she cried, and quick as a flash, she became one. 
soaring high above the clouds. Soon, she was flying over the great city, spotting the famous arch, all set with beautiful stones. She swooped down and began to dig them out with her beak. It was hard work and painful, but eventually she had pried out enough to make a collar for the giant. Stringing them onto a piece of string she had found hanging in the tree, she dangled it around her neck. Now I want to be a parrot again. And when she arrived back at the giant's castle, she flew up into his room and perched on his shoulder. Back already? Growled the big fellow. Then he noticed the color of stones, and grabbing it, delighted, hanged it around his bulgy neck. Now you must give me the crown, as we agreed. The parrot squawked, but the greedy giant had other ideas. They are not as blue as I thought. He complained, removing the necklace and holding the stones up to the light, pretending to be disappointed. What I really want is a crown of stars from the sky. Go, and bring me that instead. The parrot was angry at being cheated, but she knew she was no match for the giant. A toad, I will be a toad, she cried, as soon as she had left the room, and sure enough, she was one, hopping off, in search of the stars. She had not gone far when she came to a clear pool. Staring into the water, she saw the stars of the night sky, reflected so brightly. That they looked real enough to hold. Scooping some up and popping them into her bag, she hopped back to the castle and made them into a crown. Here is your crown of stars, she squawked, having turned herself back into a parrot. And the ugly great giant cried out with wonder at their beauty. That's more like it. He exclaimed in delight, crushing the crown onto his head. Here, take the queen's crown, for this one is better by far. The parrot seized it from the giant's hand and flew to the window. Make me into a monkey, she squawked as she clambered down the tree that stood outside. Make me an ant. And she crawled up and over the high wall. Then, a deer. She squawked and, as a fleet-footed deer, she raced over walls and rivers until she came to the sea. And now a fish. She cried, plunging into the water and swimming to the beautiful underwater palace. Where the queen and all the creatures of the sea were gathered together, waiting for her, but they had been waiting a long, long time, and some of them had quite given up hope of ever seeing her again. I'm tired of all this waiting," grumbled one. "I want to see what is happening up above." It must be month since that silly little fish girl went away. I'd say the nasty giant killed her, or she would have been back long ago," said another. "The river flies will be out by now, and we will miss our chance to catch them," complained a third. At that very moment, a voice from behind them cried, "Look, look at that sparkle of brightness 
flashing towards us. The crowd fell silent, and the queen rose up on her tail with excitement. In came the little fish girl, holding the crown tightly in her mouth, and all of the other sea creatures moved aside to let her pass. On she swam, right to the mermaid queen, who took hold of the beautiful crown and placed it on her head. And then a wonderful thing happened: the queen's tail turned into legs. And her handmaidens, all around her, shed their scales and became girls again. They stood around, admiring one another, and then admiring the little fish, who had regained her own shape, and was more beautiful than any of them. You have given us back our life, they cried. Crowding around her and weeping from joy, they soon said farewell to the creatures of the sea and returned to land. The queen was thrilled to see her husband again, and particularly pleased to see her son, for she had left when he was only a baby in arms. But there was an air of sadness. About the young man, even though his mother had returned at last, what's wrong, my dear? She asked him as they walked together in the garden. If I can give you happiness, it will be yours. No one can," said the prince sadly, for. I have fallen in love with someone I can never marry, and I must carry my sadness alone. And he told her about the deer in the forest, and how he had fallen head over heels in love with her as soon as he looked into her eyes. Ah," said the queen with a smile. "I think I know how to help you." For she knew right away that it was the fisherman's daughter that her son had encountered. She called for the girl, who had not yet returned home to her parents, and when the prince saw her, he was struck dumb by the beauty of her. The young woman came closer, and her eyes were those of the deer in the forest. Please, do not kill me," she whispered in the prince's ear. "For I have far to run and much to do." The very words you used when we met in the forest. I have found you at last, my love. The young man took her in his arms, and their hearts were filled with joy. And the queen, his mother, watched them and smiled. The queen and king, the prince and the fish girl princess, have lived happily ever after. Thank you for listening, boys and girls. This is from your story fairies. Have a good night. Sweet dreams.